Paleo Runner podcast is devoted to finding better ways to live, run, train, and eat. I'm your host, Aaron Olson. You can find more information by going to paleorunner.org. You can also follow me on facebook.com slash runpaleo or on Twitter at runpaleo. Email feedback to Aaron at paleorunner.org. I wanted to take a minute to tell you about a product I've been using called 3Fuel. 3Fuel is a sports drink that gives you sustained energy throughout your workout. It gives you fat, protein, and carbohydrates. To get 10% off, use the coupon code 3FOLSON. Go to paleorunner.org and click 3Fuel at the top of the page. If you're listening on the podcast app for iPhone or iPad, click the link displayed on the app right now. My guest today is Dr. Nicholas Campitelli. He's a, pod- a podiatrist in Akron, Ohio, specializing in foot and ankle surgery with an interest and enthusiasm for running, as well as helping other runners with injuries. Dr. Nick, it's great to have you on the show. I'm very excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, Dr. Nick, um, your blog, it seems like I've, every time I log into Facebook, someone new is posting it to the news feed, and there's a story that you have posted about how you helped a woman who had uh, pretty fairly collapsed arches, I guess you would call it, and by putting her in a minimal, minimalist shoe, you actually helped her strengthen her arch and get it back to looking normal. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, that two-year case study that you did? Sure. So this is a person that um, has been a runner for most of her life and ran in orthotics as a result of a flexible flat foot deformity, deformity or flexible pes plano valgus. And she had suffered with chronic low back pain and knee pain off and on for years and just kind of took it as normal as a result of her running. So with the whole... Um, my whole involvement in minimalist running and, and barefoot running and, and that sort of philosophy, we tried to transition her out of orthotics and into a more minimalist type shoe. Okay. And the intent was not to fix her feet. The intent was not to strengthen her arches directly or change anything, but it was to kind of improve her running form. Okay. So she had been running in A6, and the A6 she was wearing at one point had about 2,000 miles on them. And she was just the type of runner that didn't believe in the whole cushion philosophy. And so she was just would go out and run. Okay. So what we did was got her out of the orthotics and then she just continued to run in her ASICs. Then we transitioned her from there into a New Balance Minimus as well as uh, Vibram Five Finger. She was running in both. And throughout the time period, um, the, the pictures that were – the, the first pictures that were taken were taken shortly – after her first marathon, her first marathon ever. So you have to remember, this person had never ran a marathon. Okay. And goes out and runs her first marathon in a pair of New Balance Minimus shoes. Uh, okay. And has no problems. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. So the intent of that first photograph was to show, and, and, and I don't know if anyone has recognized this yet, but that pic, that, that's, we use that picture to show that people with flat feet can run a marathon in minimalist shoes. Okay. Okay. So then fast forward two years, um, and seven mar- six marathons later, okay. then we decided to take another picture. Mm-hmm. And then that's, that's where that all came from. So there was no, this wasn't a, a prospective study. This was just a, a look back at, hey, let's look at this foot type and see what changes have occurred. Because with some of the current studies I've done in the past year and what we've known anecdotally, foot structures are changing as a result of running barefoot and running in minimalist shoes. And this was a, a prime example in looking at these photos. Now, I, I also think I have x-rays of, of this person. I'm not sure. I, time hasn't allowed me to go back and look. But that would be very interesting as well to put a rest to some of these critics' comments that this is just Photoshopped and, and <laughs> it has nothing to do with that. Right. Okay. So what made you uh, take this approach of, of having her wear minimalist shoes? I mean, why not just uh, build up an arch support and put that in her shoe and, and send her on her way? Well, there's not enough evidence in my mind to support doing that. And if you look at the literature, there was actually just an article published this month in America, uh, in JAPMA, Journal of American Podiatric Medical Association, that looks at running-related injuries. Okay. And we just don't have concrete evidence that an orthotic does anything as, okay. as far as foot type. Now, it, I guess the, the easiest way that I can put this in, in terms without citing literature is our society over the past, I would, and I use the term 40 years because it all started around the 70s with running shoes uh, becoming men. But our society has looked at 
arch type and, and people that think they have flat feet mm -hmm. in reality have a variance of a normal foot. So someone can have a flat foot type, but it's not a pathological flat foot. It might just be a variance of normal foot type. So we, we, we've over the past 40 years come to think that if a foot does not have what we call a normal arch, then it needs to be supported. And that's not true. And I think with runners, one of the things that I like to do is instead of focusing on footwear, I focus on form, training patterns, and intensity. So if they've tried five different pairs of shoes and they're not seeing relief of their symptoms and, you know, they don't, not so much that their times aren't getting better, that they're not feeling efficient, we look at their form as opposed to their shoe gear. And, and I, I like to state, make the statement that if you can't run 100 yards barefoot without experiencing, and if you're experiencing pain, you're probably not running correctly. Mm. And and I try to teach people form by having them learn barefoot because once you've figured out how to run barefoot, it's very simple then to put a shoe on and, and adapt that form in the shoe. Right. Okay. Well, what kind of feedback are you getting from your colleagues? Because I believe that uh, orthotics are a big part of your business. So are, are you cannibalizing your own business by having people strengthen their feet? Well, I, some of the feedback isn't positive, obviously. And I have a lot of colleagues that hate me. <laughs> When I brought this up about three years ago at one of our local academy meetings, I was very excited to present what we had been doing in my practice and the results that we were getting. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of them just looked at me like I was crazy. And I remember <laughs> going home and telling my wife, I said, well, she goes, well, how'd it go? And I said, well, they think I'm crazy. Uh -huh. And she's like, well, they, you know, they're probably just being nice. I said, no, they, they think I'm crazy. Yeah. And, and some of them actually said, had made the comment, we hope that this doesn't really take off because this is going to ruin a lot of my business. So, but I like to look at medicine as I'm helping people. And for me to succeed from a financial perspective or a business component, I need patients. I don't look at it as I'm trying to make a dollar amount off of my patients by whatever I'm putting them in as far as orthotics or shoe gear or prescribing them or, or selling them items. I like to make people better, and for my business to succeed, I need patience. So if, if, if it involves getting runners and making them better and them telling their friends and more, more people, to me, that's success. And, I, and I'm not looking at it as a, a, you know, I'm losing income by not putting people into orthotics. I, in fact, mm -hmm. I see more people now that I'm not using orthotics than when I used to use them because they're coming to me realizing that, hey, maybe I can get better without putting these stupid pieces of plastic in my shoe. Right, right. And so with that lady uh, of the pictures that you put up, did she was, it, was she able to get rid of the knee and the low back pain? It kind of just resolved. And it wasn't, I, I think one of the critics had posted on my blog, who hasn't had low back pain two years ago and, and maybe doesn't have it now. The situation wasn't that she was being treated for low back pain or knee pain. It was just a common complaint amongst hers. And it, and it gradually did resolve. Okay. So did it resolve because she's running in minimalist shoes? My theory is it resolved because she got rid of the heels on her running shoes. There's no medical-based evidence that states we need to put any type of lift under our heel. So, there, you know, there's no logic to putting a heel under your heel or in a running shoe. And what I think is just so humorous to me is the podiatric um, profession, and, I, and I'm not bash bashing my profession, but for so many years we've we've looked at ankle equinus. And ankle equinus is a condition where if you're lacking dorsiflexion at the ankle joint. So if, if your ankle, I don't know if you can see, let me grab a foot, excuse okay. me. If your ankle is not at 90 degrees and it's in a position like this, that's termed ankle equinus. Okay. And a lot of the biomechanical people will say in order for the foot or the ankle to function normally, it needs at least 10 degrees of dorsiflexion. You follow me? It has to move up approximately 10 degrees. Okay. So if you don't have that dorsiflexion or that movement up of 10 degrees or, or more, mm -hmm. and you're in plantar flexion, we call that ankle equinus. Your Achilles tendon is tight and you have to stretch it. So they work on all these stretching exercises to increase the range of motion. And then what happens? They put them in a cushioned running shoe with the heel and they put them in ankle equinus. Right. Okay. And when I've asked... He, well, nobody can answer it. And it's so funny how it's, it's almost like for years I've done this as well. So, you know, I, I think her pain resolved because we took out the heel and got her running in a flatter position. Okay. And it allowed her body to naturally adapt to normal position.
So it's is it not necessarily about the minimalist? Because I know there's some shoes like Ultra that basically they're still cushioned, but they have a flat sole, which, which is a zero drop. Or, or is it important to get rid of the cushioning as well? You know, I, I think it depends on how far you're running. Cushion is more of a, um, you know, it, it makes the foot feel better the longer distance you're traveling. Mm -hmm. I think it does inhibit proprioception. So if you're taking, so proprioception is if your body's ability to feel the ground, your foot sends a signal to your brain, and the brain sends a signal back to your foot and lower extremity muscles to then contract those muscles to adapt the foot to the ground. So if you're putting cushion or anything, the more, the more, the higher the amount of material you put between your foot and the ground, the worse your proprioception is because your foot now can't feel the ground. And we know this with diabetic patients who get calluses, blisters, they, they, their feet, the muscles atrophy because they have lack of um, nerve sensation. And that lack of nerve sensation leads to poor proprioception and all these conditions start to develop. So we worry about it in diabetic patients, but when we put someone in a thick cushion running shoe, we don't really care and it doesn't make any sense. So I think to some degree, the more cushion you have, the less proprioception you will have and the weaker your foot could become. But I think there is a place for some cushion. And even myself, if I'm going over 10 to 12 miles, I like a little bit of cushion. But for people, there's a lot of debate out there with people initially transitioning to a running shoe. They think that they need cushion as a transition shoe. Right. I think that that's bad because they're going to learn. They're going, they have the ability to still cheat in that shoe. Whereas, <laughs> I've got whereas, my daughter here, so she's making a little noise during the interview. I've got her in a baby Bjorn. No, I was wondering why you were balancing. I thought maybe you had music on in the background. <laughs> nope. But there's, there's a lot of debate over should we put someone in a transitional shoe with cushion and then it's not as much of a shock to their foot. But I feel that I'd rather them go completely minimal or bare because then they'll understand the, the form and the change a lot easier because they can feel the ground. Okay, so... I've had, uh, I'm sure you're familiar with Daniel Lieberman and I've had him on the show and, and uh, mm -hmm. he's a big fan of barefoot running and minimalist shoe running. Um, what do you think about this idea of evolutionary medicine where, where we kind of look at the body as a structure that's evolved over a long period of time and not necessarily look at every deformity or everything that seem, appears to us to be a deformity to actually be one and, and that a lot of these structures like the arch have developed for reasons such as, you know, helping... Uh, the the uh the elastic return when we're running and things like that is that something that you take into account in your practice definitely um i, I don't look at it as an as a whole evolutional based um i i guess standard maybe because of my religion maybe you know i, I think that brings up a whole other topic but mm -hmm. i think our foot was designed to function without a shoe and whether it has evolved that way or it was designed that way, I, I, I really think that it's made to work the way it was created or evolved. Mm -hmm. And with that said, when you brought up the elastic properties of the arch, you know, if, if anyone wants to discuss shock absorption and you, and you take a model of a spring and how a spring is designed to adapt to, to, to absorb shock, if you look at your leg, your leg has three points of shock absorption the ankle joint, the knee joint, and the hip joint. If you land on your forefoot or your midfoot, I won't argue about forefoot versus midfoot striking. Okay. If you land on the forefoot or the midfoot, the ankle can now absorb shock, the knee can absorb shock, and the hip absorbs shock. If you land on your heel, you've just eliminated one-third of that spring. So, I mean, I think it's pretty, without looking at the biomechanical or kinesiology properties of this, simple physics will tell you that you, you're cutting away one-third of your shock absorption. So those who say, well, yeah, all that stress is going to the Achilles tendon, well, well sure, the Achilles tendon can adapt over time and become stronger and, and absorb that stress as opposed to that stress being shot up the outstretched straight leg. Gotcha. So tell me a little bit about your minimalist uh, guide to minimal, or your guide to minimalist running shoes. Um, why did you feel that you needed to put out this guide out there? So what was happening was the discussion and all the points that we're talking about now would come up in my office and would come up with friends and colleagues and runners. And I wanted to make something that was simple, that would catch the attention of a, a professional, a physician, or, or any type of healthcare professional, but yet also a 10-year-old could pick up and read and understand running form. And we 
created it with the intention that it was going to be a cheap $1.99 book that could reach a lot of people, not so much from a financial standpoint, but someone that could be in my office and I could say, hey, look, I don't have an hour to talk to you about running form. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to look at New Balance's website, goodformrunning.com. That'll help you. And, and here's a guide that we've created that shows video, pictorials. And if you want a little bit of the background on why it's working, it's all there. And it's, it, has it been successful? I think the people that have read it, it has helped them. So I don't look at it as terms of how many I've sold. I look at it in terms of the people that are reading and it's helping them run. And, and that was kind of the whole intent of it. Okay. Well, let's give the listeners a little bit of an idea of some tips that you could give people if they're interested in moving to a more minimalist shoe. How would you recommend starting out? I, I think the first thing that they need to do is take, all, take, take their shoes off and run with nothing on and learn and, and feel the ground. And, and feel what it's like to heel strike without shoes on and see how it hurts and learn just to, to kind of pitter-patter or take short steps across the ground without shoes on. And then once you have that kind of feeling for, for running without shoes, it's then time to go to the stores and explore the different types of minimalist shoes because people have that, that predistinction that shoes should be comfortable. And everyone will say, oh, are those shoes comfortable? It's not about you know, the comfort. Right. And I think that once they understand the way their feet should strike the ground and, and the way they should be running, it's then time to go and look at what shoe they would like to wear. And I think this is an awesome time right now in the shoe industry because we have so many new shoes that are coming out that people are creating. And if you look at Ultra that you had brought up, I was told that they just passed Adidas in, in running shoes sales and in volume, and they're number eighth now on the list. And they've only been in creation for three years, so it's it's amazing. And they're a great shoe. I recommend it to a lot of my patients. Okay. What shoes are you personally running in? You know, I run in a lot of different shoes um, because I'm lucky enough to be trying and testing different shoes. Um, I just did a marathon Sunday in the Skechers Go Meb 2, which oh. I had not run in. It was the first time I put it on, and I ended up doing a marathon in it, ah. but I, <laughs> which I don't recommend, but I... I my foot's kind of adapted to be able to run and change frequently. Okay. But I had been training in the GoMeb 1 prior to that, so it wasn't much of a difference. But the Skechers are now probably my favorite go-to shoe for, for marathoning or the distance. Uh -huh. um, as far as like a 5K or a shorter race, something that's flat. I've worn the New Balance RC 5000. It's a racing flat. I've actually done two marathons in that one. Um, and I run in five fingers a lot for shorter mileage of like five to eight miles. Um, I've tried pretty much most of the minimalist shoes out there I've tried. I, I, I've run in ultras, um, mm -hmm. scores I've run in. But I think my, my favorite ones are the Skechers, Five Fingers, and New Balance, and, and definitely Ultra. Okay, so I've tried Skechers, and it, uh, you know this was, a, I think, about two years ago. They ha it seemed like they had still a little bit of a rocker sole. Um, how is that affecting your stride? Well, the Go Run... And I think there was another model that came out around the same time as that. Maybe it was the Go Run 2. It was too squishy and cushiony for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I tried that. I wasn't able to run in it. I, I like the Go Meb is firmer. Okay. And, by, and, you know, by losing the cushion, there's an actual study done on this, and I can't cite it off the top of my head, but there was a study done that looked at cushioning properties of running shoes. And the more cushion that was lost, so the longer you wore the shoe, the more cushion that is lost with just the, the impact creating a loss of cushioning, the less muscle activation you would have. And with less muscle activation, the less likely you are to have an overuse injury. So for me, a more cushioned shoe that's squishy and causing more motion in the foot, I think is bad. So I think they improve that shoe by making it firmer and creating the go meb. And, you know, I, I don't know, for me, I wouldn't call it a rocker bottom. It's more of a, it, it encourages that midfoot strike kind of feel. And I, and I like that. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Nick, you know, sometimes when we when we take a more natural approach to things like minimalist shoes and things like that, it starts to kind of uh, bleed into other areas of our life. And I know you've got some posts up on diet and nutrition. Um, do you have any thoughts on the paleo diet or what kind of diet are you following? I do. I have a good friend. My running partner actually follows the paleo diet. And, um, you know, I can honestly say I don't know how you can argue it because it's, it's whether you're looking at evolution or creativity, mm -hmm. that's what we had on this planet. And we didn't really have much else to eat. So when someone says, oh, it's just another fad, 
or it's just another new diet that they want us to try or people are trying. I don't know that you can say that because it's been around for millions of years. <laughs> right, right. right. Okay. So I, I, I guess my biggest take on it, I, I, I look at, I think the two strongest diets in our society are, are, are you know, carnivores and herbivores. I think you either have vegetarians or you have people that will eat meat. And I, I think that in our in the United States, we eat too much meat. I, I think that we, it's okay to have the meat in our diet, but I think a lot of people are eating too much. And, and, I'm, and I'm concerned about some of the paleo diets that they're just saying, well, it's, I'm paleo. I can eat as much meat as I want. Mm. And that concerns me because I think if you look at, you know, I, I posed this question to Lieberman before too. I called him and we had a discussion about it. I said, you know, how, if, if you look at what meat could be doing to us, and now we're saying to eat organic, and his thoughts were, if the, the, our ancestors didn't have the types of meat that we have today for two reasons. One, they did, it, was, it was more lean, obviously, and, and not as, as fatty because the animals weren't sedentary and were running. We had to capture them. Mm -hmm. And they also weren't eating as much of it as, as we are now because they could only get as much as they needed to eat. So I, I think with that said, you know, I think we just need to eat in right moderations and right volumes. And personally, I, I kind of kind of follow it. Um, I have an issue with, with stomach problems with ulcerative colitis, and um, I recently stopped eating anything with gluten in it and have had a lot of success off of that. It's, been, it's a mild condition that I have. I'm not, mm -hmm. it's never hospitalized. It's never been anywhere where I've active or, or had any problems with, you know, se severe symptoms. But I, I can definitely see a decrease in, in bloating and abdominal discomfort from going gluten-free. Wow, 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 that's that's great. You know, I've had a lot of people on the show who's who said that they've had stomach discomfort in the past, and when they've switched to a more paleo style diet, they've seen a lot of that go away. Absolutely, and one one, I guess the best way that I would put it is, you know, my wife would always say, "Why do you always feel so guilty after you eat something bad?" And I'd say, "It's not that I feel guilty; I just feel bloated, and I hate that bloated feeling because then I don't want to do anything for the rest of the day." So. I, I don't look at it as I, I did it to lose weight or I did it to be healthier. I just, I, I feel better eliminating those foods more so the wheat. And, you know, I still eat bad. I'm human. I still eat, you know, some of the, the bad things. But I will say that I would rather have the icing on the cake than to actually eat the cake itself <laughs> because the cake itself makes me sick. It's, it's that flour, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, Dr. Nick, it was great having you on the show today. Where can people go to find out more about you? Um, I, I would advise them to go to my blog, drnicksrunningblog.com, and, and from there they can even find my office site, which is Dr. Nick Campy, and it's slowly being transitioned to nomahealth.com as our practice has grown. But I think any of the runners or people that just want to learn more about minimalist running and running in general, drnicksrunningblog.com would definitely be a great place to start. Great. You know, Aaron, do you have one more? Can I show you? I have two models with me here. Can we yeah. maybe you can edit this in if you'd like? Okay. I would like to show you something. So if you're looking... I, you know, I got a lot of criticism on this whole abductor hallucis thing. And I have two models here. So if, if you were to look at this one here, this is a normal arch type is, is what this model is depicting that we show patients. Mm -hmm. This muscle here is your abductor hallucis muscle. Okay. And that's what I'm saying had it caused a lot of the arch deformation or improvement of the arch because it got stronger. Mm -hmm. If you look at a model depicting a flat foot, mm -hmm. Look at the abductor hallucis on this one. It's stretched out, okay? If you follow what happens to muscles as they become stronger, they shorten and they develop muscle tone. Mm -hmm. And with more muscle tone and more shortening, what it does is as this abductor hallucis shortens, it creates an arch. Mm -hmm. So that's where this whole – and I'm not – this is not me talking. There are plenty of studies out there that show this. And there's also some recent um, literature, it's not even recent, within the last 10 years, that looked at contractivity of this abductor hallucis muscle, and they measured the navicular drop height. Okay. So this bone here, the navicular, the more it drops, the more your arch deforms or flattens. By stimulating the abductor hallucis muscle and contracting it, we saw an increase in the navicular drop height, so it went up higher. Okay. So we know that when this muscle contracts, our arch gets higher. Mm -hmm. and, and it's it's just kind of almost 
humorous that people are not believing me when we have all these studies out there that show this. So it's a muscle I think that's very overlooked. Most people don't think of foot strengthening as something that's, you know, practical in doing when re in reality it is. And you know, I think if you would strengthen that muscle, you will have more benefits in relying on a piece of plastic. And as far as strengthening the muscle goes, I believe there was a study done by Nike when they came out with the free that showed an increase in diameter yes. of, of foot muscles. Exactly. In 2005, and it wasn't published, the, the paper itself wasn't published, but they, it's, it's, it's referenced, it was brought up at a, I think it was actually in Cleveland, Ohio, where they brought it up at a seminar or conference, but they did MRI imaging of the abductor hallucis muscle after, I believe it was a 24 week period of running in the Nike freeze, the initial version, which I think were the, the higher heel height than the, like the 5.0s, or I'm, I'm not sure what the heel drop, the drop height was, mm -hmm. but they showed a strengthening increase in, in or hypertrophying of the abductor hallucis muscle. So you're, you're absolutely right. We, we do know that by running that way, you can increase muscle strength. And have you, you know, myself, I've found since switching to a minimalist shoe, this was years ago now, but my foot seemed to get uh, wider or maybe stronger, and it doesn't really fit into normal running shoes anymore. Is that something that you've noticed? Yes, and, and the subject as well that we had blogged about in this two-year study, she can no longer fit into a lot of her old female shoes because her forefoot became much wider. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is, and I even have radiographs of my foot pre and post transition, which oh, shows really? okay. an increase in toe space between the first and second toe. And what's happening is the intrinsic muscles are developing mu muscle tone, and we're using our toes to now splay and grab the ground the way they were designed to work. And, and, they're, and they're developing that finger-like position. And I, I use this example a lot. I ask patients and runners to get on the ground and do a push-up. And most people do a push-up with their fingers splayed like this. If you were to do a push-up with, with fists, it's harder because of physics. You have a smaller base. It's not as wide. The same thing goes for our feet. If our toes are spread more and are engaged in the ground, the tendons that come off of these toes that then go into the muscles in our calf are becoming stronger and are more functional, and it creates a stronger base of support. Mm -hmm. So when, when people say, well, you know, what, what does strengthening my calf muscles have to do with any of this? Your calf muscles supply the tendons that go to your toes. And the more that those toes can become, you know, um, oh, what's the term I'm looking for? Ambi not ambidextrous. The more, um, uh, more toe splay or I yeah, the toe splay, but the, <laughs> I'm at a loss for words here, but okay. right, the, the more your toes can splay and grab the ground, the stronger your base of support is mm -hmm. and the less stress that goes to the plantar fascia or the abductor hallucis muscle, or your posterior tibial muscle. So, so you see where I'm getting at is mm -hmm. these other conditions, plantar fasciitis, posterior tibial tendonitis, might not occur if we have a strong foot. And something else to consider, you know, 40 years ago, we called plantar, we called heel spur, or I'm sorry, we called plantar fasciitis heel spur syndrome. Mm -hmm. We thought they were because of heel spurs. Mm -hmm. We now know today that they're not heel spurs, it's plantar fasciitis. Okay. But I propose that it's not even plantar fasciitis, it's abductor hallucis flexor digitorum brevis muscle, flexor hallucis brevis muscle, those muscles are inflamed. There's been studies done in patients that had plantar fasciectomies, the surgery to, to cut the plantar fascia to decrease the tension, okay. and they took that plantar fascia and sent it to the histologist, and there were no inflammatory cells. Hmm. So is the plantar fascia itself inflamed, or is it the muscles that are overused? Because they respond no different than an overuse syndrome in a tendon. They hurt in the morning when you first wake up, they hurt after you've been sitting. In, in my opinion, it's those muscles that originate in the same exact spot as the plantar fascia onto the calcaneus that are becoming overused. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Wow. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm a big, right now with, with this entire topic, the abductor hallucis muscle is probably my, one of my main focuses because I think it has a lot more to do with the foot in low extremity than we take for granted. Mm -hmm. You know, I had, I had a, an Achilles problem a few years ago, and I found that by switching to the five fingers, which allows more of a toe splay, the Achilles problem went away. And, and, and I think it had something to do with that fact that you were talking about that when, when your foot lands and it, and it can splay out more, it can absorb more of the shock um, because it was almost instant by switching to those shoes. Um, you know, not it, after a day or two, that Achilles pain went away. So I found that pretty interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. And you're now using your flexor hallucis longus, your flexor digitorum longus muscles, 
they're becoming stronger and they run with the Achilles tendon. So now that they're stronger, some of the workload off the Achilles tendon is gone because you have stronger muscles to assist it. So yeah, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, thanks again. Thanks, man. Take care. If you like podcasts, you're also going to like audible.com. There's over 100,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Kindle, Android, or MP3 player. Go to paleorunner.org and click Audible at the top of the page to get your free audiobook download. If you're listening to this on the podcast app for iPhone or iPad, click the link displayed on the app right now.